peace and blessings. This is your brother Asaram Hotep with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. I am here once again to bring you a pertinent uh, scholastic lesson. Um, I will be continuing my series on the topic of the meaning of Kemet and providing the listening audience with particular strategies and methods uh, to answer the question and to discover the quote unquote etymology of uh, the place name Kemet. So this is going to be a full lecture. So uh, we're, we're looking at at least an hour and a half of discussion. So I would advise everyone who is listening live or listening after the fact to make sure you have something to drink, um, some snacks or something to that nature, a, you know, a course pen and paper, or the, unless you're typing notes or something to that nature, but something to take notes with. Uh, this is a class, so I'll be uh, discussing this in a, in a way that I would uh, teach a class. So if you are in the chat um, and you have questions, I will try to look in the chat periodically um, to see if, you know, someone has questions or something to that nature, but uh, I may not see it. So towards the end, you know, make sure that you have written your questions down and that uh, you're able to repeat them Right, again, towards the end, if I if I don't catch it and um, don't address it, you know, live on the spot. So since we have a lot of ground to cover, I'm going to just get into it. So um, let's get started. Okay, I'm trying to make this a full screen option here. Presentation mode. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm just double checking to make sure everything shows up nicely for those who are watching. Uh, Okay, everything seems to be a go. So again, thank you all for, for watching and for listening. And uh, again, we will get started. So for those who have been following the debate on the meaning of Kemet, you should know that from the beginning, for a good number of years, I've been stressing the pertinent point that the word Kemet is a toponym, right? Uh, that implies a certain amount of, sorry, these notifications coming up. Uh, hopefully they won't be too bad throughout the uh, this discourse. Uh, so getting back. So that toponyms are in fact, uh, have their own, you know, grammatical morphemes and things of this nature. And so there are some ideas that must be understood when we're dealing with toponyms. And so we will get into some pertinent information as it regards toponyms. And so the title of this presentation is The Grammar of Egyptian Toponyms, a case study of the place name Kemet. So let's get it in. Uh, unshameless, or I guess I can say unshameless, well, shameless plug. Um, part of the reason why this is such a debate is because, uh, at least amongst laypersons, is because they're not familiar with linguistics and 
linguistic methods for evaluating linguistic questions. And so instead of trying to necessarily fight this in the community, I have decided to offer a class on an introduction to linguistics. And so this class is available on my website, www.asarimhotep.com. And the details for it, you know, are there. So I, I would encourage everyone to visit. The class is only $40. And so um, this is, I think this is more than affordable. Uh, the, it's not something that I, you know, plan to necessarily make money. I just want to offer this to the community so that we have a group of individuals who are linguistically trained and competent enough to evaluate linguistic arguments. And so in order to do that, one must one must study this. So this helps to kind of narrow one's focus. So this is a introduction to linguistics, a crash course. And so uh, it will get you grounded in linguistic concepts so that when we have discussions like this, you can follow along. So I try my best to explain certain concepts as simply as possible. But after a certain point is going to, is going, there's going to be a need for some more um, professional training and, and linguistic jargon for to, to be able to explain certain concepts. So I offer this course to the community and I hope that you are encouraged to take it, the class. Um, so, you know, we have uh, a fairly decent, you know, uh, competent, you know, lay community, conscious community who can use linguistics in their own life as part of their African African American studies. So go to my website, www.asarmotep.com and sign up for the course. So now, just a reminder of the fundamentals of the argument. And so since we're dealing with toponymy, there was a an essential point of the conversation that needed to be addressed. And so this is what we'll deal with here. So for those who need a reminder, we're discussing this word in the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. We colloquially pronounce as Kemet. And so the ancient Egyptian language did not write out the vowels in the old Middle Kingdom uh, writing scripts. So we are left with the consonantal skeletons and this is part of the reason why we have such a debate to this day, because of the, the absence of the vowel sounds. So for those who can't necessarily read hieroglyphs, um, I just want to you know go over this real quickly. So this hieroglyph is what we call a biliteral. And that means that you know the, the prefix bi means two, and the the literal has to deal with the sounds and so it represents two sounds in sequence so by two sounds in sequence so the sequence sounds is k and m we also have this owl glyph with the sound that represents m or that's that's uh it represents the m sound the the nasal and the bilabial nasal, as we say. And so this is a, actually an alligator's tail, the end of an alligator's tail, and this is an owl. So you have KM and then you have M again. So this M is, is understood as a phonetic complement. That means you don't necessarily read this as KMM, you know, uh, but this just lets you know what the second consonant is in the, the bi-literal, the bi-consonants literal glyph. So this is, so we read this simply as Kim. Then there is this glyph here, which is uh, a raised bread loaf, which 
is associated the T sound. And then this glyph here is a classifier. And so the ancient Egyptian language is a classifier language. And so there are classifiers that are attached to the words, the main root of the words in the language, but they, because it is a written and a pictorial form, the classifiers in the language are also represented at the end of words to give you a visual of the classifiers, the grammatical classifiers that are attached to words. And so you do not read this, uh, although it does have its own pronunciation. So we, we say newt, and um, this is actually, you know, two water channels that cross. And, um, and so this is the Gardener 049 sign. So all together we have what we say is Kemet. We just enter E sounds in between the consonants so that we can just pronounce it. But that's not necessarily how it is pronounced in ancient Egypt. So this is the word Kemet. So uh, keep this in mind for those who are not really uh, familiar with the, the hieroglyphs. So from the first uh, debate that I had with our good brother Netanab, um, this was one of the slides that I showed. And uh, I'm choosing this here because I, I mentioned that historically, by doing the literature review, we come to understand that there was two proposals, two hypotheses for the meaning of the place name Kemet. And so the first hypothesis was that Kemet means black land. And then um, the second one was that Kemet means black people. And so the second hypothesis originates with uh, the late Dr. Shekhan Diop. And so here's one of the texts, great African thinker Shekhan Diop, edited by Ivan Van Sertima, that presents his argument. But his original argument in full is in his 1977 work on the genetic relationship you know between uh egyptian and modern Af black african languages so um so dr diop says the egyptians had only one term to designate themselves kemet the negroes literally so he's interpreting the word kemet to being negroes or blacks the blacks in the ancient excuse me in the egyptian language a word of assembly is formed from an adjective or a noun by putting it in the feminine singular. Kemet from the adjective Kim equals black. It therefore means strictly Negroes or at the very least black men. The term is a collective noun which does describe the whole people of Pharaonic Egypt as black people. So what he's trying to say is that there is a root Kim that means black and that this ap applies as a description to to uh, to characterize the the native inhabitants of Kemet, so he's saying that Kemet means black people. So in contrast to Kemet means black land. So he was arguing against that notion. So <laughs> this is an, an important observation made by uh, Professor Sonaron at the UNESCO uh, conference. So he he presented this argument in 1974 at the famous Cairo Museum Symposium. And this is uh, one of the responses that was recorded and typed in the book, uh, The Peopling of Ancient Egypt and the Decipherment of the Marotic Script, where it kind of gave the, the conference notes for that particular uh, debate and discussion in which Dr. Theophilo Benga and Shekhanti Jop was a part of. So Professor Sonaron intervened in the course of a lively exchange on views on linguistic matters between Professors Abdallah and Diop. Professor Sonaron stated that in Egyptian, Kim, feminine Kemet meant black. The masculine plural was Kemu and the feminine plural Kemenet. And I think this is actually a typo. And so, uh, it, so the feminine would actually be Kim, 
uh, KMWT, not Kimonet. So this is a typo, uh, or at least KMUT to use their uh, their transcription here. So the form Kimitiu or Kimitiwa could mean only two things: those of Kimit, the inhabitants of Kimit, the Black country. It was derived. It was a derived adjective, Nisbin, formed from a geographical term which had become a proper name. It was not necessarily felt with its original meaning. Compare, for example, Franc, France, French. And so, just because you say it doesn't mean that it it invokes, um, you know, a general meaning and association in in uh, of the language so to designate black people the egyptians would have said kemet or kimu not kimetiu in any case they never used this adjective to indicate the black people of the african hinterland whom they knew about from the time of the new kingdom onwards nor in general did they use names of colors to distinguish different peoples so you know, even Diop at this time was reminded of a pertinent issue that we have here, that the word Kemet, you never find a word Kemet in any papyrus, on any stela, anywhere that describes anybody. The word Kemet actually meaning black does not exist. The only time you see the word Kemet as it refers to black is when the T sound is in reference to, excuse me, is in concordance with a preceding noun. So if Kim is the adjective, a noun in front of it would have to be in the feminine form and then it would attach the T to it. So that's why I said, um, I don't have it here. There's, there's another one where it talks about Rimech Kimmet. Like it would have to have said it in that fashion. And so this form here, Kimitiu, can never, ever, ever, ever be interpreted as um, a, a descriptor because it means those of. So that's why this, this Y here, this is the Nisby form. And so it's those of belonging to the place Kemet. And so the W is the plural. So this is, this is there's Kim, there's a suffix T, and then we have another suffix here, Y or I, and this means belonging to, and this is the plural form. So it's the 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 the, the plural um, people belonging to the place named Kemet. So you can never um, use Kemet as itself or uh, Kimu um, to represent this this uh, particular um, idea. And so this was given to Diop. And he's still, even in his 1977 publication, tried to argue against it. Um, and so this is, you know, something that has to be dealt with uh, regarding uh, Sheik Antadia. <laughs> so, as I stated before, the, the discussion is about toponyms. And so a toponym is the name of a place. It's simply a place name. Any derived... Uh, uh, any name derived from a place name. So that's what a toponym is. And it, and it derives from the Greek word topos, meaning place, and onym, meaning name. So onym is the cognate of the English word name. So it literally means place name. So if you are speaking English, you would just simply say place name. But if you're using, you know, just the linguistic jargon, you would use the Greek version of the English place name. You would say toponym. Topos onim, place name, or, you know, so, uh, and so toponymy is the study of place names. And so uh, keep that in mind. So the determinatives or classifiers, here are a few of general place names uh, that, that these, these were used for in, in many of the place names. So this is one of those classifiers that I mentioned at the end. So here's the old 49 glyph, the town glyph that we mentioned earlier. But this is actually, it represents a social political unit, but the, the grapheme itself is of 
inner interlocking uh, or inner crossing uh, water channels. And so most of this has to deal with water with the exception of this right here. This is a road, but this is a water channel. This is a pool. This is a tongue of land, but surrounded by water or water through it. This is irrigated channel. This is uh, mountains, uh, irrigated land and just plain water. And so this this should be we'll, we'll get back to why that's important later. And so the the word Kemet itself is written with these glyphs. So you see the form Kemet here with N23. And you see Kemet here with N36. And then you see Kemet here with the 049. And the N23 and 049 glyphs interchange. Actually, all three of these interchange. But I just wanted to give an example here for the word Sapet, which means a district or a gnome or a necropolis. So you can see these two versions. These are interchangeable um, classifiers. So <clears throat> we're going to deal with gender assignments. So remember that Sheikh Ante Diop made the argument that the T in Kemet was a feminine gender. And so I, I challenge this notion that it is a feminine gender. And we'll see why in a moment. So to, to understand what gender is, I'm just going to take from you know Wikipedia. They're generally correct on this. So they say there are three main ways by which natural languages categorize nouns into genders. According to logical or symbolic similarities in their meaning, meaning the semantic, by grouping them with other nouns that have similar form, morphological, and through apparently arbitrary convention, lexical, possibly rooted in the language's history. In most languages that have grammatical gender, a combination of these three types of criteria is found, although one type may be more prevalent. So, you know, gender in classes or gender is a type of class. So nouns fall into particular categories in languages. And often these languages will represent these classes with some type of grammatical morphing. So what this is saying here is that usually the, the quote unquote genders belong to uh, or are determined by three different criteria. So one is semantic, one is morphological, and then one is just arbitrarily, you know, there's a, it could be lexical or based on a, a language or a population's history. So that's what it's saying right here. So they give three different um, criteria for determining, you know, uh, gender, right, in a language or, or in terms of its association. So the, the first one is called strict semantic criteria. So in some languages, the gender of a noun is directly determined by its physical attributes, sex, animacy, etc. And there are few or no exceptions to this rule. There are relatively few such languages. So this is strictly based on semantics. Then the second one is called mostly semantic criteria. In some other languages, the gender of nouns can again mostly be determined by physical semantic attributes, although there remain some nouns whose gender is not assigned in this way. The worldview, for example, mythology of the speakers may influence the division of categories. So I, I give an example of, of exactly what they're talking about. So I discussed this in my upcoming book. So um, in the introduction to African languages uh, by G. Tucker Childs, he says, in an impressive detailed study of the morphophonology of two little research dialects of Fula or the Fulani language, Breedveld, 1995, looks in detail at the semantics of noun classes. So the, Ful the Fulani language is, is, is a noun class language. It has, it's, a, it's a language of classes. What she finds is that their meanings are deeply grounded in Fulani cultural practices and even mythology. 
Only with that knowledge can one understand how cows, fire, and the sun all belong to the same noun class. So that they're saying is that cows, words for cows, words for fire, and words for sun all utilize the same grammatical morphine for the class, for a particular class. They all belong to the same class in the Fulani language. And I add to this discourse that probably that is the case because of paronymy, that the words for all of these sounds sound alike. So for example, in the Wolof language, you have knock for sun, sunlight, sun rays. Cow is nag. And then the word for fire or flame is lock. And so N and L interchange in Wolof. So to burn, roast, conflagration. So within the same semantic category as fire or flame. In the Fulani language, nange, a nugai. So nange is the word for sun, sunlight, sun rays. Nugai is a word for haze or weak sun. And then a word for cow, nag ginge. So this word nag is the word for cow. Then to set on fire or to burn, nuka de. De is a, uh, a verbal suffix. It's equivalent to the uh, verbal suffix for those who read Metonetra, you would transliterate it as capital A. But it's the nasalized uvular trill. This is also attached as a suffix in many verbs in Egyptian. So, of course, we find the same with uh, in, in Egyptian, that, that the words for all three of these concepts sound alike. So there's a word, you know, uh, um, that's for like sunlight, sun rays. And then you have riket, which is a Hathor cow. And then you have riket again for a uh, fire or flame. So this T suffix here nominalizes a, a verb meaning to burn. So the root of this actually belongs to, uh, it's just like with Wolof and the Fulani. So we see the same words in, in Wolof and Fulani and in ancient Egyptian. And so because these are, uh, they sound similar, in a paronymic way, now we understand why they are categorized the same. So when you look into the ancient Egyptian records of Het Heru or Hathor, you know, you see that she is a cow with the sun. She's associated with the sun. And you know, her form is also a Sekhmet, which has to deal with fire and burning. And so you see this actually play out in the ancient Egyptian. So this semantics helps to strengthen the relationship between Wolof, Fulani, and ancient Egyptian. So uh, peace to Assis Fall, Lord uh, Finesse, Sister Tamika, Yevra, Abjuwer, Brother Ankh, Les uh, Lesa Darcy, Brother Wujawu, um, and others, Goddess Sekhmet, June Money, Brother Geb T'Challa, and those who I'm missing, Brother Robert, uh, thank you all for uh, listening live. And um, let me continue. <laughs> so um, the man is actually uh, answering the question. He's actually uh, sucking from the cow. So you'll see some pastoralist societies where they drink the cow's milk directly from the cow. So they don't pasteurize like we do. Uh, here in terms of drinking milk, they'll drink it directly from the cow. So this is a throwback to old pastoralist societies. So, and this is symbolic here in terms of the, the, the life force and nutrients from this goddess who represents the night sky, the night starry sky. So uh, I'm going to continue. <laughs> so there is a correlation between gender and the form of a noun. So that's the last, the third criteria. So, and, and this is the one that's going to be pertinent to our discussion. In many other languages, nouns are assigned to gender largely without any semantic basis. That is not based on any feature such as animacy or sex. So, you know, certain, like there's a gender, a masculine, a feminine, and a neuter gender. 
And so things are assigned in masculine if there's a natural masculine form of some kind of animate being, uh, whether it's an insect, uh, animal, or a human being. It's assigned, if it's male, it's assigned to masculine gender uh, and vice versa for the, the feminine gender. And so the third criteria, it, it dispenses with that. So the, that kind of thing isn't a, an, an, an issue. It isn't a cr criterion for categorization. So, um, so it's not based on any feature of the person or thing that a noun represents. However, in many languages, there may be a correlation to a greater or lesser degree between the gender of the form of a noun, such as the letter or syllable which, which it ends. So because a noun ends in a certain form, it will be assigned a gender simply because the noun ends in that form. So I want y'all to pay attention to exactly what I'm saying. The, the, the gender assignment has nothing to do with any type of characteristics. It's only associated with because of the form. So let's give an example. So the uh, wiki gives this example. So in Portuguese and Spanish, nouns that end in O or consonant are mostly masculine, whereas those that end in A are mostly feminine, regardless of their meaning. Nouns that end in some other vowel are assigned a gender either according to etymology, by analogy, or by some other convention. These rules may override semantics in some cases. For example, the noun uh, membro, a miembro, member is always masculine even when it refers to a girl or a woman and pessoa or persona is always feminine even when it refers to a boy or a man the reason why they're always going to be either masculine or feminine is simply because this uh it ends in the vowel o or it ends in the vowel a so a is a feminine um vowel excuse me, a feminine grammatical morphine and O is a masculine grammatical morphine. And so the, the word may end in O and have nothing to do with gender at all. But because it ends in O, it will be, um, it will concord, it will have concord with masculine, uh, uh, the, the masculine gender. So always, so keep this in mind as we're having this discussion. So what I argue is that the third criterion, which we just discussed, is what is happening in ancient Egyptian. So, for example, we we shown this slide before. So this comes from the hymn to Sin Werset the Third, Plate Three, Line Five. So it's uh, it says he came, he caused the nation of Kemet to live, he dispelled its afflictions. So this the word its underlined here is represented by S, this, this grapheme here, S. So we have shinu, this word here, and then the word is followed by the suffix S. So this is a singular feminine plural. And the reason why you have the singular feminine plural here is because this word here, the noun, ends in T. But this does not mean the T is a feminine suffix. The suffix, because it ends in T and they do have a feminine T, that's why you see the S, the, the feminine suffix S here. And, and we'll demonstrate that in a, in a, in a bit. So <clears throat> gender versus noun class, same or different. This is a, this is an article written online and you can, uh, you just type this in and uh, the the word, will, uh, excuse me, the essay will come up. And so it says, on the other hand, there are languages that have what is traditionally referred to as noun classes. And so like when you say gender is a type of class, those, the question is, are they the same or are they really different? I really consider them different. This article considers them the same or roughly the same. So on the other hand, there are languages that have what is traditionally referred to as noun classes. There can be as few as four and as many as 20 noun classes, like Bantu languages have around 20, uh, you, the most full Bantu languages do, in a given language. Some noun classes include uh, Durbal and Nungubuyu, both Aboriginal Australian, 
Chichua, Lingala, Shona, Swahili, Zulu, and Fula. Remember that we said Fulani uh, has classes. That's uh, they're all Niger Congo, Ingush, North Caucasian, Juhoan, Kozan, uh, Yemas, Papuan, and others. Like with gender systems, noun classes divide nouns into groups, which often but not always have some semantic coherence. But unlike grammatical gender systems, noun class systems typically do not involve the biological sex of the individual. This is why I separate gender from noun classes, because the gender has to deal with it, the, bi is the referencing certain characteristics that the culture believes is um, based on biological sex. Whereas noun classes divides them into classes that have nothing to do with sex. And so if you find a language that has both, it is, is prime for confusion if the grammatical morphemes are the same. So, uh, but unlike grammatical gender systems, uh, noun classes typically do not involve the biological sex of the individuals. Note that unlike genders, noun classes are usually numbered rather than named. Other semantically motivated categories for noun classes include shapes, sizes, materials, origin, animacy, and abstractness. So you can have abstractness, origin, material, sizes. These are classification characteristics. So, you know, you a word can belong to a certain class just because it is long or short. You know, the, in short, we would call it the diminutive class or the abstract class. That's why I have, there's a reason why I have this uh, bolded and red. So while the latter use of terminology may seem preferable, after all, natural sex of an individual or lack thereof may be viewed as one type of semantic property that is important for dividing up the nouns in the given language. But using the term genders in quotes for both sex-based and non-sex-based systems, the way uh, WALS, uh, and they define what that is in the article, does it, has, because it's an organization, has its merit too. After all, the original meaning of the word gender is a type of, is, is that of type or class, as it derives from the Latin word genus, descent, family, type, gender, and is cognate with the Greek word genos, or genos, meaning race, stock, kin. The original meaning is still apparent from the use of the word genus, plural genera as a taxonomic unit in biology. So linguistically, they're they're the same, but there's there's a fundamental difference that separates them. And so when we say gender, we're, we're talking about concepts that are rooted initially in biological sex. The noun classes itself is non-sex based. So now we're going to deconstruct the feminine T. So this would be a good time if you, you know, uh, just need something to, to snack on or to drink, um, to get something, you know. Um, but I'm going to continue. I'm going to take a sip real quick. So uh, hold on for a second. I appreciate everybody again in the chat uh, who are listening. So <clears throat> there's a text called the Missouri Legend Explored, a linguistic inquiry into the college and people's oral tradition of ancient Egyptian origin. It is written by Dr. Kipkuich Arap Sambu, who is a native of Kenya, and he belongs to the collagen, which are Nilotic people. Now, what's significant about this group is these are actual descendants of ancient Egyptians. They were a particular clan in ancient Egypt and they migrated out during the time of the Greek invasions and went through the Sudan and ended up in places like Kenya, Ethiopia, um, the Western part of the Congo and Uganda. So that's, that's where they've spread, you know, in the past 2000 years. So um, it's, it's very important to study collagen as it regards possible pronunciations for Egyptian words and for understanding Egyptian grammar, right? So this is his second book. And so he's dealing with the linguistic aspect of the collagen language in comparison to the ancient Egyptian. 
So he says something about the feminine T. Um, that is something, uh, a conclusion that I also independently came to based on my studies and comparisons with Chiluba, which is a Bantu language out in uh, Central Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that in uh, Kikongo. So this comes from page 144. Um, well, I'm going to be reading from pages 144 to 145. So this is on 144, and the other two citations that I'm, I'm going to read afterwards come from page 145. So, but it's not continuous, so I, I, I jump. So, most Egyptologists originally thought, and many still think, that ancient Egyptian was genetically related to Semitic languages. One prominent characteristic of a Semitic language, such as Hebrew or Arabic, is the use of the T suffix to indicate a feminine class noun. The, Egypt, the Egyptologists, therefore, went ahead and classified all ancient Egyptian nouns that ended with a T feminine, with a T feminine gender class nouns in conformity with the standard Semitic practice. So let, let's let's stop for a moment. So what he's saying is that because the Egyptologists were pushing this notion that ancient Egyptian was related to Semitic or closely related to Semitic, because Semitic words that end a lot of Semitic words that end in T were feminine they automatically assign all the words, uh, a lot of the words that end in T, uh, the feminine gender. So this is a, a, an issue of uh, the, the early Egyptologists. So these were theoretically speaking an awful lot of nouns indeed considering that ancient Egyptian behaved like collagen, where almost all verbs, adjectives, and singular nouns except proper nouns are bound to end up with a grammatical T suffix in their secondary nominal form. So the if, if you know anything about the collagen language, they have a good number of T suffixes. And they also have a T um, feminine gender. The, their feminine gender, however, is prefixed to the root. It's not suffix like in ancient Egyptian, um, except when you get to for example, in Coptic. And I think the collagen language is related to one of the new kingdom languages that is more closely related to Coptic than to Middle Egyptian or Old uh, Kingdom of Egyptian. So most of the examples used in this section illustrate this fact as incidental, and it does not take a renowned expert to prompt the Egyptologists to take another look at the, this incredible oversight. Because the Egyptologists and the early linguists, you know, were so fixed on Semitic, they never really did a full analysis comparing ancient Egyptian to these other African languages, especially Nilotic languages or so-called Niger Congo languages. As a result, they missed a whole bunch of information. And so this is an oversight by Egyptologists. Why should a, for example, why should a word be of the masculine gender in the primary noun form, adjectival or verbal form, and then transmigrate to the feminine gender class in a secondary or definite nominal form? For those with a lingu linguistic background, this is a very important question, and I should have bolded it and highlighted it. So how does a word in, in it says primary form be masculine and then because there's a T suffix is now a feminine gender. If it was a feminine gender word, it would be a feminine gender in its primary noun form. You know, um, so he continues. In our discussion on the one important hermetic grammatical or inflectional morphine, the T suffix, we are, are, we are going to have to recall an observation as well as standards set by linguists that we read in chapter five, that we read in chapter five, namely that the class which is least of all exposed to borrowing is composed by grammatical morphemes. So one way that you, the, the strongest way that you can argue for relatedness of two or more languages is to compare the grammar. And so if you find cognate words between two languages and they share the same grammar, this is this is strong evidence for a family relationship. <clears throat> the morphs 
which serve as their expression are mostly homogeneous as their origin, as to their origin. This has been observed to hold true even in extreme cases of language mixture. As mentioned above, collagen generates in a standard and predictable way by means of an inflectional, inflectional morpheme, the secondary types of nouns from primary noun forms, adjectives and verbs, the Geron equivalents. The suffixation with the morphemic article T is also a prominent feature of the ancient Egyptian language. Certainly it is concerns the certainly it is as concerns the formation of nouns by means of inflecting adjectives and verbs. The rule of thumb was and still and is still one and the same. Somehow append a T suffix to the nominal, verbal, or adjectival form, and you have your secondary form of noun or geron. So when you add the suffix T to a noun, a verb, or um, an adjectival form, it gives a secondary form of the word that is related. So we give some examples here. So, so on the first row is the, the first layer form, and then the second row is with the suffix in both the Egyptian, what I call Chikam, and college and language. So, sir, sheep, kitcher, sheep, seriet, a particular kind of sheep, kitcher yet, a sheep. So, we can tell that this is not a feminine T in Egyptian because we have the same word here in collagen with the same grammatical morphemes. And collagen also has feminine T. If this was a feminine word, you would have T or chi in the front of the word. But since you don't have it and you have the exact identical morpheme in both languages, we know that this is not a feminine T. So we have the word how uh, large in in collagen has been reduced they this sound here this glottal is um is absent they lost this sound so um so now you're just left with the w which just becomes ooh a uh, woo large largeness is when you add the t so this is an adjective so if you add a t it gives a secondary form, so largeness. This is important if you add the, for example, if this was the word Kim, and it was an adjective meaning black, if you add the suffix T, you would have the word blackness. There is no such word in ancient Egyptian for blackness with a, with a T suffix. This is one of the reasons why I challenged our good brother, um, Adrian Jones, and anybody on my Facebook page to find a word Kemet, meaning black, that has nothing to do with concord, um, with the suffix T being a result of concord, with a preceding feminine noun. So you, you would never find a word Kemet, meaning black, in the ancient Egyptian language. But if you add the suffix T, it is being in a state. It means to be in a state of. So that's why you have ness in English, which is large ness. So in, in collagen, uintu, uindo. Being bad, evil, an adjective. Bunyun, enemy. Benit, evil. Bunyut, and the enemy. Or boon, witching. Bundit and the evil or the witchcraft. And we can do this again as you can you can pause this video when you know you review it and just kind of pay attention to this. You will see the same grammatical morphine is present for each one of these words, and we have perfect matches in form and meaning for each one of these words. So this informs us that these are not feminine T's in the ancient Egyptian language. So hold on one sec. Uh, there we go. So here's just some more 
were so these there's another t that's a deverbalizer in ancient egyptian so we can see this in action here so on the left hand side is the the verb and or adjective and then you get the secondary you get the noun form or secondary noun form so sir be wise serit wisdom understanding key think about ket thoughts a plan a device shemes follow a company shemes wit following suit so this is a verbal noun caress bury curset burial marry to love this is a verbal suffix i here merwut love the noun form and then you know with the nisbi here the well be loved one who is loved kenny dark kinemet darkness notice we can find the word kenny dark and kinemet darkness but you would never find kim dark or black and then kimet blackness it doesn't exist kissin painful painfully irksome adjective kissinet trouble misfortune and the cognate for this in college is kissonito so it is with that same type of criteria that in the first debate i used to dismantle the feminine t suffix argument using chiluba because for these words here and on in egyptian we have the equivalent over here in chiluba and we know that this is the nominal class seven these aren't feminine genders they don't have feminine genders and so if they wanted to do a feminine or masculine gender they would add the word lume for masculine or um uh the the word for woman kanja or something like that for uh for the feminine and so these are perfect matches and so i've been through this already you can pause if you want to review and so one of the things i know for a fact about this noun class in terms of the abstract so remember that the abstractness is a class a noun class the ancient Egyptian is a noun class language. And for the abstract, they have many different prefixes and suffixes to denote the abstract. And so the abstract, the, the, the morpheme that gave the abstract also gives the, the one for place. So for place names and things of that nature in Chiluba, that same morpheme is, is put in the front for concepts of space. And so I've been through this already. So, you know, I just, if you want to look through it again, for those who have watched this before, you can um, pause it and evaluate it yourself. So the so-called feminine T suffix, for spaces, you see, for words dealing with a kind of space, space or a place, you see the suffix with T. Just how we see here in um, Chiluba. So Chiminga, city, a town, urban center. That's why the word nit or knew it is suffixed by the T. So same thing here for place, a city, a town, nit, city, town. Same thing in Chiluba. The Acacia house, sacred precinct. Again, suffix with T. So in the Sumerian language, one of the other languages in which I um, uh, used to examine, they prefix their uh, abstracts in place with ki. Just like in uh, ki Swahili, they'd use ki, while Chiluba uses chi or shi in, in some dialects. And so I've been through this uh, uh, numerous times, so you can review this on your own. And this was just to show that Sumerian and Chiluba they use the same prefix for the same words, even if they're not, the root words are not cognates themselves, but for the same words and the same idea, this shows a strong correlation linguistically in, in terms of relationship. These are non-accidental morphemes. So in Jean-Claude and Boley's work, The Origin of African Languages written in French, he comes to the conclusion as well that the ancient Egyptian language was in fact a uh, class language. 
And that is because the language family is a class language family. And so when he did his reconstruction in Negro Egyptian, which I called Chiena into, I renamed it. These are actually four of the five fundamental classes for uh, Negro Egyptian post-classic. And so uh, these classes are for nouns and verbs. So the affix, so this is, a, you know, um, uh, scan this. So this is, these are concrete objects, you know, saying, um, and then actions dealing with time and space. So this word for function and affixes. So the affix of the animate. So this is the reconstruction. So reconstructions have stars in front of it. So this is a reconstruction and the affix of the collective, the affix of place or space and the affix of direction. So for the verbs, it's an affix of the stative, uh, the complete, the incomplete, and the infinitive. So I'm just I'm just letting you know that in the greater, larger family from which ancient Egyptian derives, it is also a language family of classes, which Bantu belongs to. So does Wolof and Fulani. So he talks about these classes. Uh, at least up to this stage, because he, he actually reconstructs some more classes for ancient Egyptian, and some were actually fossilized. But for, for coming up to this uh, page, he talks about three classes. So, les affixes de trois classes du midi Egyptian. The animate, the singular and plural, the non-animate, singular and plural, the collectives, abstracts, and the liquids. So notice that there's a non, so animate class is pre preceded by an N or a nothing or a zero. And in the plural form, the W. And actually there's a plural W, excuse me, there's a singular W animate class suffix. But I'll tell you there's actually more classes. And, um, but, but at this stage of his reconstruction, he, he only reconstructed three. But I just want, I'm using this one to make a point. So notice, the non-animate class is suffixed by T. But then there's another series of classes that is also suffixed by T. Because we don't know the vowels, we may think that these are the same, but they're not the same. They're different classes. They're different um, forms. Just like how we saw, let's go back to the, um, the collagen. So you see... They're preceded, some are by different vowels, yit, to, do, some are uh, suffixed by vowels. They're different ones, but they're all represented by T or D in some dialects. So I'm gonna go back now. So the collective and abstracts in the liquids are, the, are T. You also have a, a, a class of T for body parts. You know, which also there's a variant S in the language, which lets us know that a sound split from an original t, a simultaneous art, articulation of T and S together. But notice that there's no plural form for collectives and abstracts and liquids. Because you can't have plural abstracts. You can't have plural collectives. Collectives are already uh, kind of a plural. So that's just like saying, Books is like I have four books. This is instead of I have four books. You can't put a plural on top of a plural. This is this is important because a lot of people argue that the T in Kemet is a collective, and so if it is a collective, it can't have a plural. So um, I'm putting in Boley's original words here in French. So those who, because I'm a translate into English. And um, so this is just for those who want to pause and type it out and translate it themselves and make sure that I'm translating uh, accurately or somewhat accurately. So, so in Boley on page 37, 372 states, 
classes and genders therefore tend to merge in Middle Egyptian, becoming increasingly rare. In the end, the only class distinction that can be detected in the six languages languages is that between the animate and the inanimate. In Songo, the feminine gender and the class of abstracts and collectives also merged, and this situation had to go back to the very last stage of Negro Egyptian. Indeed, these three categories, feminine, collective, and abstract, are mentally thought of as related to each other, not only in Middle Egyptian and Songo, but also in Hausa and many other Black African languages, not treated here. This example shows how language can have a lasting effect on thinking and emergence of concepts that are far apart from each other. So what he's saying is that based on his analysis, these ideas merged um, because these suffixes began to sound alike. And so what I argue is that they really didn't merge per se, is that in certain instances, because they sound alike, they were confused in a few languages, including the ancient Egyptian. And so what I argue is that the T in, in Kemet is not a feminine suffix, but you see the feminine concord because um, it is one of those languages that no matter the ending, if it ends in a certain form, it is considered a fem it is considered a masculine or feminine, even if the if if the 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 suffix itself or the word itself in the the phono the phonological form is not itself feminine or masculine. And so <laughs> here's here's an uh, an example here. So the this top one, this top row here is an example that was uh, taken from uh, Golet's original article on the, the place named Kemet that I, I've cited in, in a few of the uh, videos that I've done already. But this, this is an excerpt from uh, Mintu Hotep in Dynasty 12. And so this is one of the titles of Mintu Hotep that is written in this hieroglyph here. And so it says, Hiri uh, tep in kemet wit desheret wit. When you see the determinatives written with three, three, three times, this is a plural. This is not a singular. So it's saying that basically kemet in a desheret. So he is the he's the the chief or king of all the inhabited places and the uninhabitable pla uninhabitable places. Some will interpret this as the black places or the uninhabitable black places. Or, or excuse me, the uh, uh, the red places for the de the word desheret. For those who are still arguing that desheret is uh, in this instance means red and Kemet means black. So to demonstrate my point here, I also added these, these forms here. So you see this, this phrase here, emi er, newt, newet, meriwut. So this is the head, the head or the chief, of the new settlements. It's a title. This word meret here is the adjective for new. It follows the noun, which is the newt sign for you know towns or populated spaces. You see it written three times, the same way that you see as a determinative here written three times. This is why in the in the dictionary it has the W. T. So with if if the if Kemet is plural, you have to add W T. So this is how you find it, you know, say in the text uh, for for the scholars who transcribe this. Kemet T with an additional W T. And so here you have the W T added here. So this lets you know that this is plural, ahead of all the new settlements. So settlements new. So the, the word here has to take on the, the, uh, the, the it, it, it's in harmony or concord with the preceding noun. 
So that's why you see the WT here and with this word here that means new. <laughs> so the fem, this is a, a, the, the feminine plural here. And so here's another form here, but this is not the plural. This is the double, the double. So is T, which means the two palaces uh, or the two places or two palaces, the designation for Egypt. So this is the, uh, the system of concordance and agreement. So remember what I said, if the T here was a collective, then you can't have a plural collective. This lets you know that this is not the collective T. This is a different T. Because you can't have a plural collective. Same thing with the word newt. You can't have a plural collective. If the T in the word for newt or newt were um, the collective, you can't have a plural collective. So keep this in mind. So this is this is why I know for a fact, and as we demonstrated in the other videos, that this T is simply the word for place, land. You can have plural lands. You can have plural spaces. But you can't have plural collectives. So <laughs> also... Which, uh, which helps to prove that the T in Kemet is not feminine. This is from the Arma this this excerpt is from the Armana period, and it's the Hittite treaty. And so we have the glyphs here that you can see, and then we have the transliteration here, and I have these highlighted. It says, "Without that, the great chief of Hatti." which is a place uh, in, the in the Middle East, which is uh, Indo-European speakers from Anatolia, could ever invade the country of Kemet to take possession of anything there. I have highlighted this word, per, because this is the definite article. This is a masculine definite article. So the land of Kemet, masculine definite article. If this was feminine, you would have the feminine definite article, ta. So we have to explain why, and, and I can cite some more instances where Kemet is in concord with masculine um, definite articles, adjective, things of that nature. But I just showed in the other previous slide, let's go back, um, it in concord with the feminine here. So how can it be both? I just explained it. For some scribes, because this T, um, there, there's a feminine T and this word ends in T, they assumed that it was feminine and so they did it they concord it with the feminine. Same thing with, uh, but for the other scribes, they got it right. It is not feminine, just as we, as we see in this example here. And so you see the masculine um, definite article again here. You know, the great chief. It's not, a, it's not the great chief this, is the so you have the the masculine definite article so this is the late period and so this served uh as a somewhat article in the middle kingdom um but mainly as a demonstrative so and then this uh what you see here at the bottom is just basically this phrase written uh in a different way in in a war to bush uh dictionaries so you have here pa ta and kemet the land of Kemet. This is masculine. And so the lands here of Kemet. 
And so, um, and what I wanted to show again, just for another argument that we were having, that you can only interpret the word Kemet as a place. That's it's a place name. And so this is reaffirmed by this word here, M. So um, where it says Kemet to take possession of anything there. That's this word here, there. And so we see it in another text here. Remetch Kemet Netiu M. The people of Kemet who are there. There, M again. Or Yim. From the Tel Sanuhe. So, and this is just the full um, um, Walter Bush page where you can see where I was showing earlier, as well as uh, another title, you know, saying uh, 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 what we showed earlier, you know, so you can see these in the actual Walter Bush dictionary. And then if you can translate German, you know, uh, if you can read this handwriting of his, you have to blow it up if you if you have the online version. Um, because th these aren't entered in the TLA. So you have to go to the actual war to wish to see these. So now, let me take a, a, a squiggle real quick and I'm gonna check the chat to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, nothing thus far. So um, I'm glad y'all still holding on. Sorry, I had to take a, a quick squiggle. I encourage y'all to, you know, stand up, stretch a little bit, you know. So you know, we we're going to get into some more deep stuff. So the 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 intent is to watch this a, a number of times so you can get it. And so. Don't worry if everything doesn't click immediately. So I'm going to show you how linguists and even language speakers can get confused in, by their own language. And so we're going to use the Hassa language as an example. So from what I'm about to cite is a 1984 article by Dr. Paul Newman on ethonyms in Hassa. So these that's the word ethnonyms are, you know, names for ethnic groups. And I should have put the page number on here. I don't know why it's not on here. Um but the Hassa language has a suffix Awa. It's actually more than one suffix called awa or wa. And sometimes the Hausa speakers will get, will get confused on how to use it. And it's also caused some confusion amongst linguists. And so what this um, professor is, is doing in this article is bringing clarity and, and showing that these are actual different suffixes. And they're not the same. So he says, for example, the ending awa as a derivational suffix indicating community. This is going to be important because the ancient Egyptian has the same suffix. Most Hassa grammars, for example, Kraft and Kurt Green, treat awa as an inflectional ending comparing comparable to una, uwa, ki, ni, ai, and all other plural morphemes in Hassa. So there's a uwa plural morpheme, but this is different than awa morpheme. There's also a uwa feminine gender in the language. The form Hasawa, Hassa people, for example, is viewed as a plural of bahashi, bahashi, Hassa person. So when they want to say a person, their quote unquote nisbi form um is they 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 prefix it with ba so bahashi is the singular and then hashawa hasawa is the plural of a hasa people and then bahashi 
is a Hausa person. In the same way that Kakani, grandparents, is correctly viewed as the plural of Kaka, a grandparent. We have the same uh, word in Yoruba, in Akan, and in Chiluba, in Kikongo, for grandparents. I would suggest that this standard analysis is incorrect. The suffix awa is not really a plural marker. Rather, it is a derivational affix semantically akin to ba. In other words, ba and awa are independent derivational affixes that have come to behave as if. These are, in italic these are italicized as if they were grammatically paired. So the Hassa ethnonymic construction thus exhibits a suppletion of the kind that one finds, for example, in the Dutch occupational forms. So um, I'm going to skip to um, this bottom part here, section 5.1, or chapter 5.1 in this article. So the Awa toponymic suffix. So there's an Awa ethnonym suffix, and then there's an Awa toponym suffix. So just like there's a suffix T in Egyptian and a suffix W in Egyptian for toponyms, Hausa has Awa or Wa for toponyms as well. There are a large number of towns and villages in Hausa land, as well as quarters of towns which are formed with a suffix Awa or Wa. Most have all high tones. These Awa toponyms are built on a wide variety of roots, personal names, tribal names, titles, common nouns, verbs, and even simple place names. So he gives some examples of these place names with the Awa suffix and their meanings. So notice that the suffix doesn't change the state of whether it's a verb or a noun of the meaning of the word, of the root. So Musawa, Musa is a proper name. So it's the place of Musa. Bindawa, Bindawu, proper name, the place of Bindawu. Naibawa, Naibi is in deputy, the place of the deputy. Yarmi, Yarimawa, Yarima, prince, the place of the prince. Amariawa, Amaria, bride. And so even for verbs, Rugawa, from Ruga, to flee. Gagara, to be impossible, another verb. And just Dara, the name of a town. Like all names of towns and villages in the house of the place names in Awa are all grammatically feminine and command feminine singular concord. The reason why this is the case is because they have a feminine suffix uwa or ia and it sounds similar to this so just like in ancient egyptian they have a t suffix and because it ends in t for many of the scribes they have a feminine singular concord in a hasa language they have the same thing with awa and uwa And so they give an example here, Tamburawa, Tana. So this is their feminine suffix. This is a feminine suffix here, or Ta, just like the feminine T in um, ancient Egyptian. So Tamburawa, Tana, Dayar, Kasua, Maikayau. Tamburawa, she has a good little market. But this is a town. This is a town. So they're saying she or it has a good little market. And we see the same thing here. So this is the feminine, you know, um, plural here. They, Musa supporters, they drove out Yakuba supporters. So this town, these are town names here. And so, um, he says here, it has generally been assumed without much serious thought on the matter that toponyms such as Daurawa were derived from nominal phrases containing plural ethnonyms. So, you know, uh, linguists made an assumption here. Um, 
However, there are a number of problems with this literous approach. For example, Darua has, as a place name has three high tones compared sometimes to the ethnonyms with low, low, high. So this is at least in the living language of Hausa, you can tell the difference because Awa as a, um, a toponym suffix has all high tones. But Awa as a ethnonym suffix has low, low, high tones in the word. So you can tell that they're different by that way. And so all toponyms are grammatically feminine, whereas one might have expected them to be masculine since the agreement should have been with the, the, the presumed underlying masculine head nouns. So it's really a masculine, uh, if, if we're, if we're going to assign gender to it, ua is really a masculine suffix. But because it sounds like awa, the feminine suffix, this is why it's treated like a feminine in a lot of cases. And so I have this box style for a reason. He says, a better solution to the interpretation of these toponyms presents itself when one recognizes that the suffix awa is not intrinsically a plural marker attached to ethnonyms, but rather is a derivational suffix denoting community. So it's a word for a community, but we'll show that it's actually a word for place and that there's a correlation between place and community. We'll get to that later. So just keep that in mind and um, understand that this is what we'll be talking about uh, you know, in the near future. So uh, getting back to it. As in English, the concept of community can apply equally to a place or to a social group of people sharing common characteristics or interests. So this is a political space, of course, with people. That's a community. The names of towns such as Daurawa and Rugawa are not derived from ethnonymic phrases. Rather, they are formed directly from their underlying roots by use of the Awa ethnonymic form directly from their underlying roots um, of the Awa ethnonymic toponymic community suffix. When used as toponyms, words with Awa are all grammatically, excuse me, uh, feminine singular, as is true of, of non-derived place names such as all grammatically feminine singular as is true non-derived place names such as Kano or Katsina. When used as ethnonyms, they are all grammatically plural, semantically either plural or often with tribal names uh, collected. And so what we argue, I argue is that these are totally separate things and we'll see why later. This being the case, in order to express the idea of a single individual belonging to a particular community or ethnic group, Hasa has to resort to other means, namely the use of construction with the ba, person of, child of. So just like, so if, for example, the, the, in the ancient Egyptian language, if they wanted to tell, say a person of, they would have to add um, to you or, uh, um, well, most words or, or place names ended with T anyway. So it's really just the, the, abs, the, the addition of the Nisbi the I belonging to. So in, in, in Hasa, the quote unquote Nisbi is Ba in the singular, you know, and um, they have a different one for the plural. And so uh, instead of describing Hasawa, Hasa people as the plural of Ba Hashi, it is preferable to treat it as a derivational form in its own, of which the Ba Hashi is a suppletive, and I know I'm pronouncing this all wrong, so all you hostile speakers, uh, don't don't kill me. Is a suppletive singular uh, individuative. The true plurals of ba forms are to be seen in significant pairs such as bahago, bahagawi, left-handed persons, people, and in the achievable ethnonyms such as um, this form here, asbit. So this was unnecessary here uh, to read, but uh, hopefully y'all get the point here. So. As I stated before, the Awa ethnonym, not ethnonym, but the uh, suffix of place is in Egyptian as W. So we see that when they wanted to denote places, just like with the, the, the T suffix, they also had W. So for storehouse, in the when we say boo, the really is the word B here for foot, and then a suffix of place. So we say Bawa. And so you can marinate on this on your own time. 
And so these are actual, you know, uh, place names and directions. So the east with the W suffix, Resu, the south, W suffix, Idihawa, Delta marshes, Tab, quote unquote, Mehu, the delta. This is the, the um, W place suffix. All of these ethnos, Abidos, Abidu, here, the W uh, place suffix, Koptos, Elephantine. Libya, all the W place name suffixes. So this is in contrast to the T suffixes for place names. So Mehat, the Delta Marshes. Waharet, Oasis, Oasis region. Behadet, Edfu. Wawat, Northern Nubia, which is a word for road here. And so y'all get the point here. So going back to Mboli. Page 351 is showing you these two different forms of places. So the, the table 6.12.5 comparisons of the uh, verbal nominal suffixes, the verbal noun suffixes. So you had the form T here. It's a suffix of place. In Coptic is I coming from se, set place. Se, Ra, Zande, Hasa, A. So they, they also have another A, but there's also a feminine A. So you can see how the, the, the confusion can happen in the language because they have an A feminine, a long A, and then they have an A place, of suff uh, place suffix. And so they are totally, completely different suffixes, but um, it, they, they can be confused. And so Somali has the same um, as, as the Hasa, ah, in both of these forms. So the reduced form in Negro Egyptian is tree, but it all it comes from Kriri. This is the full form. And so it's this form here for place that gives birth to all these forms. The suffix W for place, in Sango, Ingo, Gu, place, in Zande, Ga, Wari, place. So notice here in Hasa, that wa or awa we spoke of earlier, it derives from ruri place. This is not feminine, so it is in its suffix form. It can't be feminine by itself. So the only reason why this is feminine is considered a feminine, uh, as Dr. Newman uh, informed us, is because there's a wa suffix uwa for feminine. It's a confusion thing, but it's 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 clear as day that they're not the same. And so this is from a Hasa uh, dictionary that I have. So it also gives a secondary form, gure. And you can see that it, it's more so in alignment with these forms here. So rure and gure is a word for place, land. So now <laughs> we're going to get into toponymy. So, you know, hopefully we ain't got that much longer. And you know we can we can get this. So, the the following slides are going to be excerpts from this text here. It's called a study on some Semitic toponymic types of the second millennium BC in the Southern Levant um, by Dr. Polly Rakonin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So, one one of the reasons I'm citing this text is because uh, it gives you a methodology. He talks about a methodology for, for analyzing toponyms. So there's a, there's a proper linguistic way to analyze toponyms. And so he says, as noted by, oh, that's, that's me, uh, as noted by Rakonin, who, who the author of this article here, one should study toponyms utilizing the following linguistic methods. You have first have to observe the lexicon, then the phonetic characteristics, then the morphology. So we dealt with the morphology already with the, the suffixes and the prefixes in the different languages for place names. So we dealt with that. And then with the structure of toponyms. And so we kind of dealt with that. But we're going to get deeper into this last one, number four. So this, this is the methodology. You have to deal with all four of these issues when dealing with toponyms. So this is why you can't, 
try to, you know, debate the word Kemet without understanding the rules of toponymy in ancient Egyptian and what is revealing to us. So I'm going to introduce to y'all a new word. So the structure of toponyms, he says, suffixes are sometimes used to mark toponyms, just like in ancient Egyptian with the suffix T. These kind of suffixal elements are called topoformins. So place formants, forming, forming place morphemes, topoformins. So that's your new word for today. I want y'all to memorize it, a topoformin. So when we're talking about the suffix T for place names and the suffix W for place names in um, ancient Egyptian, it is a topoformant. All righty, got it? Good. These morphemes serve as markers of toponyms. Duh. Most formants originate from so-called generics of names or from derivational affixes. A generic answers the question of the characteristics of a place. For example, a lake, a river, a village, a mountain, a hill, etc. Some examples of topoformants can be seen below, which is going to be the next slide. But notice what, what he says here, that a generic, these, these topoformants or these suffixes or prefixes for places are words, they're generic words in the language for lake, river, village, mountain, hill, or some other kind of characteristic of space. So for example, in Great Britain, there's a word from the Anglo-Saxon uh, form tomb, which means enclosure or state. So for all my, my people in London and things of that nature, uh, you'll know a lot of these names. Uh, or from Great Britain, you'll know a lot of these names. So Everton or Kingston. Some of y'all from Jamaica, from Kingston, Jamaica. Kingston, the ton suffix here is a, a suffix for place. Ham is a word for farm. And as I argued in my 2014 paper, ham, farm, is cognate with the word kemet. But I won't get into the proofs for that right now. But just note it, that Nottingham or Birmingham, all y'all in Birmingham, Alabama, you live in a, a type of kemet. Berg, which has the... the the G sound has uh, palatalized into Y. So you say bury, which means a fortification. It's a word for fortification. So Salisbury, Sudbury. So these are all topoformants. Suffixes to the root that doesn't change the meaning at all or does, it doesn't bring about secondary nouns, none of that. All it does is let you know that this is the place of kings the place of ever, the place of Notting, the place of Birmingham, or the farm of Birmingham, Birmingham Farm, Notting Farm, you know, um, Fort Sows, Fort Sood. So like when you say Fort Hood, you know, like um, in, in back home in San Antonio, I, I, I live not too far from Fort Sam Houston. That's a topo form. So that's when you say Burr, you're saying Fort. So Fort, Fort South, and then enclosure or estate, the Ever Estate, the King's Estate, Kingston. So I'm hoping this is making sense. So in the Canaanite language, they also have topoforms. forms. So they have on from an original on. So Sidion, Ashkelon, Bet, or Beth, meaning house. So Bethlehem, when you say Bethlehem, Jesus, I don't know if he was born in Bethlehem, I forgot already, or he just had to go to Bethlehem. Either way it goes. Bethlehem, the Beth part, is house. In ancient Egyptian, they would say per. So you'll find a lot of place names with per prefix. So Ayin, in spring. So in Geb is a spring. So this is letting you know that this place has is a source of water. And so this other word, Mayim or May, also 
Minneptoa. Minneptoa. This is a place with water. So I'm, I'm, I'm helping y'all. I'm hoping that y'all are able to make sense of this. So, so the, this concept in which I'm introducing y'all to as far as uh, toponym suffixes in ancient Egyptian is not exclusive to ancient Egyptian. We find this in Indo-European languages. We find this in Semitic languages and other languages around the world. And so there's another professor by the name of Julian Cooper. And in his 2015 dissertation, PhD dissertation, um, he talks about toponymy in ancient Egyptian text. And so the title of his dissertation, and you can find it on the net somewhere, is Toponymy on the Periphery, Place Names of the Eastern Desert, the Red Sea, and South Sinai in Egyptian documents from the early dynastic until the end of the New Kingdom. So uh, all of the, the surrounding place names he examines. And, and he's giving you some ideas of, you know, where these names more than likely originate and probably what language groups. So, for example, uh, on page 299, there is a place written as Bsepti or Bibisiti. And he says uh, etymology, he gives the etymology. There is no phoning P in languages of this region. So the second consonant must mask an F or a B. If it is the if it is in the Beha area, this is a location uh, in southeast of southeast using our coordinate system of Egypt. So this is the, the area where the Beha even today still live, known as the Magi. So if it is in the Beha area, one might think of the verb bubos to cause to light up or babis bury in several graves with an on there's supposed to be an onslaught that's a mis trans uh um, that's a, a a spelling error on on this page um with the onslaught t being a productive suffix in beha toponymy so just like in ancient egyptian the beha language has the suffix t for place names so he gives an example so you see here this is the footnote number so the footnote number here for uh compare quibus to hide quibasat hiding place in the beha language so they have this t as well so dealing with another word dealing with the word with kimin. A connection with the root wagim to grind powder makes sense as this word is used in one text with kimiyet gum, a quimit, or quimiyet gum, the only known product of wakimit. So wakimit is a place in the northern Sudan. And so he's suggesting that the word wakimit has to deal with uh, to grind or a powder or a gum or possibly a gum type substance. So now, um, but examples of a shift of K to G remains elusive in Middle Egyptian. The connection with the root Wakim giving the sense of to provide might be the preferable option. The oslot, so now he corrects, is correct here, T is easily explained as a nomen loci, providing place or a abstract meaning the providing one. And so this is just the Latin version of the word name place or place name. So if you say place name in English or nomen loci in Latin or toponym in Greek, they're all saying the same thing, place name. So this is this is for people like Brother Reggie who can't read um, and who don't understand synonymy um, when we're talking about when he makes the accusation that I, I wasn't addressing toponyms. When I even use the word toponym in my slides as well as the word place name. But we're, we won't mention them um anymore so uh and now it's just a footnote so there's another place name uh harawiti yit also contains a nominal suffix t which might be analyzed as being a collective suffix or a place name 
suffix attached to a nominal root, showing that you know there there are other sources which talks about this t being a a place name suffix. Um, so now we're analyzing this word ch uh, chenehet, and um, this is in somewhere in um, the Sinai or the Middle East. So a difficulty with this connection is accounting for the oslot t, which must be a suffix, possibly a feminine marker. Um, in ancient Levantine toponymy, the suffix t is witnessed in toponyms, but its exact morphological role is not apparent. Rainey suggests it may be a nominal or adjective marker. I cite this page here because he's he's kind of admitting that he doesn't know when it comes to see it's easy when it comes to Egyptian names because the Egyptians have a suffix T for place names, but Semitic doesn't have a suffix T for place names. So um the <clears throat> hold on one sec. Okay, there we go. Um the in the in the Semitic there is a hint to a previous culture, which I argue was the ones related to the ancient Egyptians um, that left their mark in terms of um, the, the suffix T. So what he says, he continues the footnote now, uh, a rainy Canaanite and Ar Armana tablets, a linguistic analysis of the mixed dialect used by the scribes of Canaan, remarks that the suffixes atu, ati, ate, ata also occur in many masculine nouns. So, uh, so this it's not a uh, it's not a feminine. It's a it's a suffix of place. For the suffix, more generally, see Lipinski Semitic languages outline of a comparative grammar. An old king of Semitic toponym Hanet might also reflect the same morphological suffix. Uh, we'll skip down to the bolded area. It says better examples of the suffix occur in old king of Semitic toponyms from the Delta, identified, and this is in the Delta of Egypt. <laughs> So he says, although it is difficult to know whether the T here is an Egyptian suffix or attributable to a Semitic morpheme, see uh, D. Redford. So he's he's saying here that again, because there's no, there's really no T suffix in Semitic that can be explained by Semitic. So how are they getting these T suffixes in Semitic toponyms? That's because of the influence of the Egyptians. And so in the footnote 1171, A. Rainey says, Toponymics in Eretz Israel, that's the name of the article, uh, for remarks that the suffix may be a sign of an earlier linguistic stratum. Now, I hope I'm not confusing you here. So they can't explain the T suffixes in Semitic by Semitic. So they're suggesting that there was an earlier group that were not Semites that lived in this area who had the T suffix that um, that survived in Semitic place names, but is not Semitic itself. So there's an underlying earlier linguistic stratum. So let's go to Semitic languages, an outline of a comparative grammar by Edward Lipinski. Uh, published in 1997. So let me go back here. So he explains, this is starting on page 570. The giving of place names depends much like that of personal names upon a sense that a place is an entity which possesses an individuality differentiating it from other places and a recognition that a place is useful and therefore worth naming. From the linguistic and the historical points of view, however, there is a basic difference between place names and personal names. Personal names are born by living people and reflect, therefore, at least to a certain extent, the linguistic situation of the area with which they are connected at the time, either of the concerned written sources or of the surveys of spoken idioms. Geographical names instead, with the exception of newly founded settlements, in general reflect an old and inherited linguistic tradition of the specific areas and may yield information about their proto-population. So a new people can move into an old area and still keep the name of the place, um, which has nothing to do with their language group. So section 67.9, notable periods of naming occur only when an uninhabited country, an uninhabited country is being populated 
and developed, or when the speakers of a new language expel the former inhabitants and impose themselves upon a country. In historical times, such situations have rarely occurred in countries inhabited by speakers of Semitic languages, although many settlements have been abandoned in the course of time and their names forgotten. Elsewhere, the place names were firmly established and clung with great pertinacity, uh, even in cities whose names had been changed by Greeks, which used them officially during centuries. For example, what is this? Uh, Leo uh, Thikia for Beirut and Ptolemaeus for Acre or Acre. Though suffering great change of form, also Libco Berber place names survived in North Africa through periods of shift in population and language. Thus, most of the Maghrebin toponyms in Ta or T, like Tanga or Tanganyir or Tipasa, etc., can safely be considered as Libco Berber, not as Phoenician. Again, there's no T affix in Semitic naturally that represent place names. But in, in Berber, they're prefixed, in Beha, they're suffix, and in Egyptian, they're suffix, all T suffixes. And, uh, and of course, in Chiluba, Chi, they're prefixed, and in Sumerian, Ki, so they wouldn't have a T suffix, I mean, T affix or prefix, because um, they kept the original form in Ki. Um, so if you see a, 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 a T, place name in the front, you know that is a Berber, a Libco Berber place name. And so, and it's not Phoenician, Latin, or Arabic. Other toponyms like Tasagida, Tas uh, present Sakida, Algeria, are Berberized forms of Latin and Punic names. So even when they take on the names of other groups, they'll still add their suffixes. <coughs> Excuse me, their, their prefix <clears throat> excuse me, of place, as in this example here. So I just wanted to read that uh, to let you know that even Berber has a, a, a T uh, affix for place, but it's prefixed, unlike Egyptian, which is suffixed. So I also wanted to point out something on toponyms that, you know, so remember that my argument is that the word Kemet has to deal with water a place with water in it, land with water, uh, an abundance of, of water and grass and vegetation in it. And so in, uh, in a related conversation about this uh, in section 67.10, he said, originally place names need not to have been fully differentiated from common nouns. Just as people now living near a large river say ordinarily the river. So for example, when you go to Zaire, Zaire is simply the word for river. The whole state was called Zaire, the river. So when the people was asked where did they live, they said by the river. They didn't have a, a specific large, you know, meaningful name for the place. It was just the river. So the same thing happened here in Upper Mesopotamia. So ordinarily the river. So the population of Upper Mesopotamia in the northern Syria called Euphrates Naru or Nahara, the river. The place naming in a full sense begins when people recognize two examples of the same class and distinguish um, the white cap, you know, from the red cap, you know, but this is the important part here because this word here is where we get the word now from. The word now comes from this word here, Naru, or Nahara, the Nile. And so the etymology of many place names occurring in Semitic sources or attested in areas inhabited by populations speaking a Semitic language is unknown. So he's re he's reinforcing what uh, the, the other author was reinforcing, that a lot of these place names aren't Semitic names at all. And so he's giving a an, an example here. And so uh, speaking a Semitic language is unknown because these names are either altered or going back to a proto-population of unknown or insufficiently known linguistic affiliation. And so what I argue is that this unknown population were uh, Negro Egyptian speakers, Chinatown speakers. And so even the word Ugarit, 
meaning field, is not Semitic. And so this word Garit, field, is also cognate with the word Kemet. And so going on, 67.16, several Semitic toponyms end in am or am or an, as the, the, the last source uh, mentioned as well, without being grammatical duals. For example, Naarayam is the region of the Middle Euphrates. The river, Nahar, Epirayam is the central highland of Palestine, so-called because it was one of the most fertile areas in Palestine. You know, I wish I had a, a, a way to, uh, I should have typed it out and bolded it, but um, but this is a scan from the original book. So-called because it was, so this word here, Epirayam, is the central highland of Palestine. This place was called Epirayam because it was one of the most fertile areas in Palestine and is planted at present with such fruit as trees of vine, olive, pomegranate, carob, etc. Therefore, its name is likely to derive from a variant form of aper or epra, meaning meadow or field of the root weper, which reproduces wafer wealth in Arabic and farmland in Gaez and is related to Peru fruit. These are all ancient Egyptian words because you have parrot field in um, Egyptian and you have peri fruit. They all come from a word meaning to propagate forward, to move forward. These are Egyptian words. But notice the, the, the whole reason why I cited this is because I wanted to show people that people will name an entire area simply because it has the presence of water or is considered a very fertile place to live. So the same methods that went into naming the word Kemet was also used in naming these spaces in, amongst the Semites and other African people, as I discussed before. So as I mentioned, the word Kemet means village or properly a new pasturage with an abundance of grass and water. That's all a Kemet is. Versus a desheret, which no grass and no water or vegetation or edible plants. And so this is why you see all these different variations here of, of words for Kemet, all having to deal with arable land and water. That's all they were concerned about. And matter of fact, this word here, Mahet, arable field, is cognate with the word Kemet. It's just the word Kemet reversed. And so extra African evidence. So remember that, and we're, and we're, we're coming to a close soon. So remember that the, the, the two writers are saying that there was more than likely some non-Semitic groups that were living in this area that gave rise to these non-Semitic place names and these non-Semitic place name features. And so what I argue is that these people that were in that area were the proto-Sumerians, the people who settled in that area and didn't move all the way to modern day Iraq. And so, for example, uh, going back to Rakonin, uh, he says pre-Semitic toponyms. Now he says, finally, it should be mentioned that some most probably archaic non-Semitic toponyms exist such as the names of the mountains, Gilboa and Gilad. Some would say Gilead. Gilead is not Semitic. Gilboa is not Semitic. These are, these are words that uh, originate from a pre-Semitic people who were living in the area. These names are possibly not Semitic because of their four root letters and an unknown etymology of the words behind the names. Very likely, these names of mountains consist of a word, gil, mountain, and of an unknown element of the name, boa or boya, uh, yad, uh, etc. And so I wanted to highlight this as word, gil, meaning mountain. So let's go to Lipinski now. So that's the voice variant. Now let's look at this. So in 67.19, section 7 says, in fact, 
there is a high number of place names of unknown origin in the areas inhabited by populations speaking Semitic languages. Attempts have been made in the past to elucidate some of these names that, uh, attested in Mediterranean areas by assigning them to an otherwise non-recorded language of a very remote people. Thus, a basic root Kal, for example, Kalahora, ancient Kalaguris, also suggests supposed to exist in numerous variants such as Kar. So K-A-L uh, and K-A-R has been isolated in a large number of toponyms and the meaning rock has been postulated, extended in one direction to mean mountain. So the word gil and the word car and cow are just various different variations of the same root dealing with mountain and, and rock formations. And I argue just space in general. Such conclusions must, however, be viewed as highly hypothetical despite the existence of some widespread culture words as wine and bull. In particular, the discovery of the Ebler writings confirms a long suggested association of the name Karkamish with the Semitic god Kamosh and the Sumerian loan word Kar, Karun Kwe. The name in its earliest attestation may thus be analyzed as Kar Kamish, Kwe of the god Kamish, but this meaning might be based on folk etymology. And I'm going to show that it is not because the Sumerian group is the last of the Negro Egyptian speakers to keep their identity and language in the Middle East. And so the Sumerians borrowed a lot from these proto-Sumerian uh, proto speakers um, of Negro Egyptian origin. And so um, some of you may have seen this, that uh, this is my modification of Jean-Claude Mboli's uh, Negro Egyptian, which I call Chiena into, in their branches. And I add Sumerian in the Parabantu Bere branch. And, you know, and so they split off from Proto Bantu. So did Middle Egyptian, the Hausa language, Zande, and the Mande language. So they split off from pre Proto Bantu. And, but, you know, Proto Bantu continued on, and we know them as the Bantu languages today and the Gabaya language. And so the Berry branch is where Wolof, Nur, Fulani, uh, Coptic, Songo, Somali, and all of them, uh, you know, fall into line. So this is, you know, saying my map showing the origins of the Berry and the Beher branches in the Great Lakes region. They migrate up. The, this is the Berry branch. So I call this pre-proto-bantu and para-bantu. So pre-proto-bantu, there's a split. So proto-bantu forms and goes this way, and, and uh, para-bantu, bere, goes this way. They migrate this way and split out from the Sudan. So from the Sudan, the Bambara, the Hassa, and the Zande speakers, you know, reemerge here. The Middle Egyptian speakers migrate here, and the Sumerian speakers migrate along with Middle Egyptian speakers and the Old Kingdom speakers, and they branch out and come into the Sumerian. So this is anywhere between, you know, um, 8,000 BCE to, to 5,000 BCE that all of this is happening. So the, the, the group of Beher branch Chien into speakers in the Berry branch, which well, the Beher branch, um, in the Berry branch, what, excuse me, let me back up. The Beher branch of Chien into this side here, there are some of these speakers also entered into the Middle East. Um, but I'm only showing the Berry branch right here and their splits. So this branch, the Sumerian comes out of Middle East, uh, uh, of Egypt in the Sinai region. And they travel here. They and some of these help to form Indo-European up here, and the others that remain help to form Semitic. And so there was a population, a group of people here who've been here since 30,000, 50,000 BC. And then later on, within the last, you know, saying uh eight to ten thousand years, there is a group of Africans who were migrating out. Even in even during pharaonic times, 
into these areas and populating these areas. So that's why we can compare Sumerian and Egyptian and find the same correspondences um, grammatically and with words. And so that Kerr and Kir, underworld, land, country, and mountains is 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 the same as the Gur and and car and and um cow mentioned by the other two scholars lipinski and uh Jehohan. so um in egyptian they palatalized the form so it became ter earth land soil and then it became the suffix of place not feminine not feminine and so in chiluba it becomes chi as far as the place suffix, but in the in the everyday word, they would say in she land, earth. So I'm hoping I'm making this clear. So in the Sumerian language, they have a word gin, mountain or mountains, and then kir kir underworld land country mountains. And so these are native uh, words. And so in Egyptian, you have kir hill high ground. And then Heru, mountain, Herit, place. These are all variations of the same word. Egyptian went through a lot of sound changes, where Sumerian and Bantu kept the older forms. And I think that it went through a lot of sound changes because the Middle uh, Egyptian speakers came from the south and entered into an area that already had people living there. And these people you know um because of their language interfering with the original old kingdom language it caused a lot of sound change in in the language so that's why you get these forms but these are all cognates so in chiluba mukuna mountain hill also bank and shore so in sumerian car harbor quay and it was borrowed by the akkadian karu So you can see the correlation here. And so Sango, Hoto, Mountain, Hoto, Mound, and it, it has a, a Koto, Mound, and then Kota, Great, because a mountain is big. So now it becomes a word for great. So you see how all of this is coming together. So it's, it's these words here that ultimately become the word for place and land, which become grammaticalized for the suffixes of places in the ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, and Bantu languages. And we can see that um, there's continuity. It's the explaining, it's Chiena Intu helps to explain why the Semitic has these um, forms in the language attached to place names, but they can't explain it in Sumerian because it's not native to Sumerian. So we see here, that uh, that these same consonant sequences are used for words for place. So in the, the Luo, among the Luo people, in Joe Luo, the language, they have car, place. In Chiluba, we have Kala, place. So remember in Hasa, we have Wure, but it comes from Gure, place. So this is just the voice variant of these forms here. And in collagen, we have ka, place. They're missing the, the uh, second consonant. So now you have a long A as a result of that. So we can see that this word ka, place, derives from core, farmland, place. Core, land, country, residential area. Area of land where people live. Kori, country, place, world, land. This is the cognate for Kemet in, uh, among the collagen. So they have it as a place and they have it as a uh, suffix, I mean, an affix for places. And so uh, you find it in this form here, ka, prefix denoting place or group. And it consists of two words, ka, meaning place, and ab, of, for. So place of. So it's in the word hot house. So when you say het, like het heru, this is here, kat or het house, ka home, koto house, korik houses, homesteads, buildings. 
So they're all the same word. And so the uh, different form of the word in collagen becomes a word for mountain. I'm, I'm showing the correspondence here. So Koi Mountain Hill or Highland is preserved in names like Koi Legend, Mount Kenya, Koi Batik, the Highland uh, Hill of the Bamboo, which has its given, which has given its name to Koi Batek area of Baringo County. And so the word Koi now generally means stone. So just like in the Semitic, uh, the place names that they, they can't explain, we see that uh, Chiena Intu perfectly explains these grammatical morphemes uh, for place names in, in Semitic. So they all come from Chiena Intu Kuri or Keri is another variation of this, meaning leg, foot, place. So notice in Sumerian, Ngiri, and the G, the N interchanges with M. There's a different dialect. And so they say Mary via, by means of, under the authority of someone with foot or place. Then you had the word er, base, legs of a table. It comes from Kuri, Wuri, and then er, root, base, limbs, loin, lap. Collagen, kill, keen, foot, bottom, kill, foot, path. So the same word for foot becomes the same word for path and road. So in Chiluba, Chikasa, foot, paw, mukolo, leg, pair of shoes, sango, gary, leg. Y'all seeing this? Uh, I'm hoping y'all paying attention. I'm, I'm giving y'all some, uh, some, some serious notes here. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it here so y'all can, you know, pause it. Uh, when you review this and understand what is going on here. So the word for leg and foot becomes the word for place. So the word for land is the word for foot. So if we, we're comparing these, we notice in all the words that we're comparing, um, we have a similar form for foot or leg in the language for place. That's not a coincidence. They all come back to this, this root here. So the semantics even exists in the uh, Egyptian language. So for example, we have this word here, waharet, leg. And so what do we say? The word for leg, foot, also doubles as a word for place. So waharet, part, department, administrative district. Waharet, district of the necropolis. Also waharet, a body of water in the hereafter. Waharet, flood. And so as Mboli has noted, he didn't use these examples, but I'm using them to reaffirm this point that he made, is that the same word for leg and foot in place is also the same word for water. And so we see this here in Egyptian, all three forms. So leg and foot, we could say foot, place, Water. We see this semantics in uh, our other languages in which we compared. Collagen, Chiluba, Sumerian. Kill, King, foot, bottom. Core, farm, land, place. Kereru, fresh, clear, river. Kereru, river, shore, shore. All this changing is the vowels. So if you was to see this without the vowels in Egyptian, you would swear that they were the um, uh, the same word. In essence, they are historically. But you couldn't say that they were the same because the vowels, we obviously the vowels are different. So the same thing in Chiluba. Mukolo, leg, pair of shoes. Chikasa, foot, paw. Kala, place. In Coco, stream, creek, watercourse. So this is a partial reduplication. So only the first part of the word reduplicated. The L sound dropped, but it's the same root. We see a pattern here. And even the word Zaire comes from this root. It means a word for river. And it's Sumerian, Ngiri, foot, path, Kur, Kir, underworld, land, country, mountain, eastern, western, uh, excuse me, eastern, eastern, or east wind, car, harbor, quay, like, like with the river shore here with collagen. And so the, the people who became the Sumerians are related to the collagen people and the Chiluba speaking people. 
And so this is stuff that is not coincidence. This proves without a shadow of a doubt a relationship between all three of these languages, including the ancient Egyptian. So Sir, Canal Ditch, Inger, Cosmic Underground Waters. You see similar shapes. And K can become S in, in all of these languages. And so the original form is Kiku or Kikwe or Kweki. And so the, the, they went on, um, through some sound changes, you know, in the language. So in the Dinka language, uh, according to Roger Blinch, the word Kuer in this plural, Kuer, means road and river. Why so? Because they, just like the other forms, remember that the Dinka is a Nilotic language, and so is collagen. So we would expect this. They are related. So we got to understand that in, in West Africa, uh, the Niger River is also called the, the, the Kwara River. It's the same word. And matter of fact, the word Niger means river. And so in the Aga language, Kura, river, stream, compared to the place name in Egyptian, Kureru, place in Nubia, which is known by the Beha as the Kwan, river, stream. It's just a place with a river. So, you know, y'all may remember this slide a long time ago where I was showing that the word ma'at derives ultimately from a word for foot and the notion of foot, road, and then truth. So the concept of ma'at, truth, comes from the word for foot and the word path. So to be truthful means to stay on the correct path. And so... Um, so, you know, this is just an extra slide. Kiduru, we know that this is Sumerian cognate for Kemet, damp ground, irrigable land. And that the word Kim itself means wet, irrigated, damp, fresh. I did a, um, a different slideshow proving that. And so this is, you know, to help demonstrate the sound correspondences in Bantu. Besides a KM or a Kam in Bantu, there's also a Kanda. In, in Bantu that also Kanda and Ganda that corresponds with the words for Kim in Middle Egyptian. And so that's why we can compare Kemet with Herero Oenganda village, properly a new pasturage with an abundance of grass and water. And so I'll show that slide again. I showed that slide previously. Um, so I don't know why it's in there. Uh, Hold on, I think it's. Uh, why isn't it moving? Oh, hell, it's doing it again. Oh, crap. And only had one more little section to go. Um, so it appears my slide is frozen. And this happens every now and then when it comes to using this particular program. And I don't know why it does it. And I can't press escape to get out. Um, crap. Uh, no, I don't want to log out. So this is what I'm going to do. Going on my other computer here. And I'm going to see what is going on. And in the meantime, while we're waiting, if you have any uh, questions, let me know. I'm going to try to figure out. I'm going to try to log in and see if it'll let me log in from my other computer. And I'm going to see if I can fix this, this issue here. But I don't want to log out and then it end the stream. And so, uh, so y'all just wait un momento. And in the meantime, again, if y'all... Are y'all following me so far? Am, am I making sense? 
is is am I you know overboarding overburdening y'all with information? You know, let me know. Uh, and we can we can get it in. So just give me a second. Again, if y'all have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm simultaneously looking at my chat on the phone, so I don't see anything. So hopefully y'all are still hearing me. <laughs> Can I start from the top again real quick? Sure, Brother Rujawu. Um, so let me skip. Um, so am I, am I just this thorough that y'all don't have any questions? Is that the case? You know, if y'all need to take a, a stretch, what is the comedic word for God? Anyone in the chat can answer that. And de nada, hermano, muchas gracias. And I was catching some of y'all argument, and I'll, I'll say this for Black World, that in to a certain extent, um, he is correct that all languages come out of Africa. And so, hold on. Uh, and so, to to that knowledge or to that aspect um uh, you know he is correct um but you know languages change over time and so we we say that they are un unrelated. Yeah, unrelated hello 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 let me let me mute this other one Okay, so um, I've, I've switched now to the other computer and logging out of the other one. So uh, I shouldn't have any interference going on now. Uh, so uh, let me know if y'all can still hear me. If that is y'all can y'all hear me uh i know it's going to be a time delay so you know, keep me informed type yes no i don't hear you uh, muchos gracias i'm 
just making up stuff now. So uh, don't say. Try to reduce. Relaunch. But not as good as before. Okay. Uh, so, well, just hold tight for a second. I'm going to join the other one, then I'm going to pause it. So. Yeah, so restore. And start hangout. Okay, so hold on one second. Let me mute myself. Okay, I'm back on the other computer. And so let me know if you can hear me better now. Because for some reason, the other computer is slower. So um, what I want to do is share my screen. Share that the common English sense of the physical world is a natural world. Okay, y'all having another discussion over there. So let me go back down. And so we're actually almost finished. So it's actually taking more time to come back than it is to uh, actually finish what I was going to say. So. So, just give me a second. Now let me put it on this one. Okay. So, new slideshow, current slide. And so I need to check with oh so I'm still let me first go back to the computer, put it on boom. Okay. So current slide. Okay, so can y'all hear me again well where you're at? Hold on, where's my... Uh, dang it, I didn't drop. Oh, here we go. I didn't drop my, uh, my mic. Okay, so we're back. Um, has it shifted on that computer yet? Okay, so we can hear me a lot better now. So why isn't it shifted to the other computer? I can't see. Um, I can't see my screen on the on the chat. Okay, let me switch back. So it should have switched to those documents. Okay, um, I don't know what's going on here. Let's 
So let me see. Presentations. And let's go back to Kimmit. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, what I'm what I'm having is an issue with the so let me know if when and if y'all can see the slides from me sharing. Because this is the very last section. And believe me, it's not even going to take that long. Um, let me share my screen. Boom. Let's get back here. So let's view. Let's just say full screen. And so, okay. So at least that is showing up. All righty. So... Okay, here we go. Cool, cool. So the the last little section, again, it, I took too much time there, uh, but the last little section is dealing with land, community, and identity. And so uh, I wanted to show like this. I showed this in the first 2014 article, and I'll be stressing this again in the upcoming chapter that there's a relationship between land and community in ancient Egyptian, or excuse me, in China into or African languages. So for example, in the Talensi language in Ghana, the word tin means earth, land, and community. See in Igbo, Obodo means community, homeland, family land. In Dogon, Ginna, family lineage and is a biform of Ghana land country. In the Tiv language, Tar means land and family. In Proto-Bantu, Chi ground country underneath and then there's Chi inhabitant and person of. In the Egyptian, Dinwit means family, but Diniu means share, portion, field, plots. In other words, land. So you had to form pot, a kind of farm, and then you have pahat or pahit, meaning men and women, mortals, mankind, people, a class of people or spirits. So what is, what is it saying here? That in the minds of the community, the minds of the people, there's a relationship between family, community, and the land. So for example, among the, uh, the tiv, we mentioned that this word tar in this text called Tiv Religion by uh, Rupert Major Donis. He says that Tiv, tar, is land, family. The tar is the complete world. It is the body and the soul, the substance and the essence, the past, the present, the people with their customs, habits, built in traditions of the ancestors, all other forms of life in the land on which they live and also the replica of this with the spirits of ancestors and others with the whole of nature so you're not just saying land and family it's an it's a there's a whole paradigm associated with tar and as i uh discuss tiv tar is cognate with ter in middle egyptian for land earth country egypt soil farmland buildable land they're the same word and so it extends as a word for family. So remember that the word Awa and Hasa is, is also a derivative. It's a word for land, place, but it also doubles as a word for community when suffixed as uh, in, on toponyms. So remember that the T suffix in Egyptian derives from ter, land. And so we see here with the cognate in the Tiv language that it refers to land and family. So it's the complete world, the substance, the essence, body and soul, the past, the present. So it's talking about the people on living on the land now and the ancestors, their customs, habits, built in traditions, all other forms of life in the land on which they live. And also the replica of this, which the spirits of the ancestors and others on the whole, there's a reason why there's a version of the word Kemet with a netter seated man glyph, 
because this is the reference in the other world. So that's why that word kanda, meaning uh, uh, land and part or whatnot in, in Chiluba and Kikongo, which is cognitive kimit, also means community. With a, with a certain prefix, it means clan. With another prefix, it means extended family. So why is this important? So you see this word is, these words, Nganda, camp village. Ngandi, camp village. Nganda, village. Nganda, camp. Mbochi, Nganda, camp. Bimba, Ganda, house. Nwena, Nganda, village, courtyard. Herrero, Nganda, village, paddock. And also, you know, the where we other get the, the other definition, a place uh, abundant of water and grass. That's what all of this means. And so camp, residence, camp, village, inner courtyard, country, earth. So you're seeing that there's a correspondence between these concepts. And so even in the Luo language, and so I mentioned this in my 2014 work, we can see, we see an example of this among the Luo of Kenya. Parker Shipton in this text, Mortgaging the Ancestors, Ideologies of Attachment in Africa, speaks about a kind of federation of lineages called Oganda, the plural form being Ogindini. It is similar in pronunciation and meaning to our Kikongo Federation known as Jikanda which we argue is cognate with Kemet. Earlier ethnographers counted more than 30 of these clans and are reminded of the 42 gnomes of, of Tameri. For the Luo, land is the anchor of one's identity. So one gets their sense of identity by being anchored in the land. And so this may be a, a, a loan word into the language from a, a possible Bantu group. Um, and so we're still investigating that. But um, as Sister Tornika has uh, reaffirmed that this can also be used in a sense of nation, Uganda, nation. And so even though they're all one ethnic group, they are composed of different nations, different Uganda. And so this is important when we're looking at the word Kemet in the hymns to Sasashis III and any other variation of this. It was after he had ruled Kemet and after he had put the desert, the desert in his company that he came to us. It was after he had protected the two lands and after he had pacified the two banks that he came to us. It was after he had caused Egypt to live and after he had removed its needs that he came to us. So we're seeing here that it's still being spoken of as term as a place name, as reinforced by the word it, the feminine um, uh, uh, singular here, the third person feminine singular, it. But it's, it's terminated instead of with the water glyphs, with the, the glyphs for community, nation. So it's telling us in here that this version of Kemet it's not the word a uh, so-called root kim describing people in terms of their physical characteristics. These are classifiers. This word kim is being classified in terms of a nation, a polity. And so you'll sometimes see this, um, and it's very rare. This is a rare form of kimit. Um, interchanging with the 049 glyph. So I'm hoping that, you know, all of this makes sense to everyone who's listening. So when you see this form here, there's no way that you can read this and argue that it is uh, speaking of the people of Kemet. Because if it was speaking of the people of Kemet, it would be written Kemetiyu, as we mentioned earlier. But that's not the case. It's still just Kemet. So it's not talking about he ruled the people of Kemet and then he ruled the desert. That's not what the grammatical, the, the, the grammar rules is actually informing us here. 
And so that essentially ends my uh, presentation. And so I just wanted to end with this notion that there's a relationship between the word for lamb and the word for community. And it's, it's suffixed in this way. And so uh, if y'all have any questions, now's the time to ask. And so I'll wait a second, given that there's going to be a time delay. Nothing. I don't know. Let me type any questions. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna wait by by five. I'm like one more minute. And then I'm gonna close out. So we've already been going about two and a half hours. So that's over what I intended to do. But um, as you can see, I had little technical difficulties. So, but I appreciate everyone for listening. I hope that this was clear. You know, take some time out to, you know, digest it some more, you know, watch over it again. But as, as we noted that the T suffix is not a feminine suffix. It is, in fact, a suffix of place name. It's a noun classifier. And so this, this lets us know, first and foremost, that it is a toponym. And so there are certain other issues that you have to look for in when examining toponyms. And so we, we prove beyond a shadow of doubt that, you know, through a number of multiple scholars, that ancient Egyptian had a T toponymic suffix. And that that toponymic suffix will... will um, will be in accordance with both feminine and um, masculine, you know, uh, concord or agreement, you know, saying with words, which lets us know that it is not a, uh, a feminine in the first place. It is just simply um, a neuter. It's just a noun class for that. It's its own class for a place. And so, um, so I hope this helped and to bring some clarity to this this question and i will see you all next time let me get out of here and stop sharing i bid you all adieu and enjoy your friday night if somebody's having a party i'm coming over and all that good stuff so anyway love and light talk to y'all later peace